Hi everyone, um, my name is Saba Suleiman. Again, I'm an MS2 at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley School of Medicine, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Yen Deng. Dr. Deng is, a, is an Associate Professor of Pharmacy Practice and Administration and Director of Global Health at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore School of Pharmacy and Health Professions. She earned her Doctor of Pharmacy from the University of the Sciences in Philadelphia and completed a specialized PGY2 residency in ambulatory care at Temple University School of Pharmacy. Her practice site is located at Chesapeake Healthcare in Princess Anne in Pocomoke, Maryland. Dr. Dang is an immunization provider and serves on the Maryland Statewide Advisory Commission on Immunization and Maryland Medicaid P&T Committee. She received the Excellence and in Innovation Award from the Maryland Pharmacists Association and the top 100 women and leading 50 women in Maryland from the Daily Record. And now Dr. Dang will talk about treatments and vaccine development in regards to the current pandemic. And please remember to put your questions in the Q&A box below. Dr. Dang, you have the floor. So hi everyone. Um, when I was asked to do a 20 minute presentation for the treatment of coronavirus, I thought it was a near impossible task because of how much information is generated in this topic nowadays. So rather than make this presentation comprehensive, I'm going to focus on the main highlights for this topic and what you should know as a student working in the middle of a pandemic. And was everybody able to hear me and see my slides okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So let's reflect on 2020 because um, I like to give every year a name and title. So I would call 2020 the year of fines. So like many of you, I spent a significant part of 2020 first trying to find toilet paper. Now the, now, I tried to find internet hotspots and later went to try to find the days of the week. And right now, the entire world is in a race to find the cure for COVID-19 first. So if we were to plot a graph of the number of people on the y-axis compared to time on the x-axis, this would probably be the hypothetical graph of our patient's level waiting for scientists to find a cure. So while this drug discovery process you're seeing might seem rather long, keep in mind that it takes normally about 10 to 12 years to bring a drug to market. And in that time, they have to spend a significant amount researching the effects of the drug on the body. So the rates at which drug investigation research is occurring now is unprecedented at this point because we're able to approve clinical trials in a matter of days. And one of the reasons why this is possible is something called the Coronavirus Treatment Acceleration Program from the FDA. So this is a program that allows patients to get new treatments for COVID as soon as possible, and at the same time, find out whether or not these drugs are safe and effective through expedited protocol review and clinical trials. So, so far, there's over seven, 570 drugs in development and about 270 clinical trials for the potential therapies of COVID-19. However, we don't have any FDA approved drugs for coronavirus. And despite this fast pace, we have to be careful about what's evidence-based versus what's fraudulent. So unfortunately, there has been a rise of fraudulent products with claims to prevent, treat, mitigate, or even cure COVID-19. You can find this list of drugs on the FDA website, but I would think that the newest claim or the My Pillow guy with Olandrin would probably be listed on here soon. So in terms of treatment, there's many drug categories that are currently being tested to treat coronavirus. We have antivirals, 
which keep viruses from multiplying, cell therapy products, which include cellular immunotherapies and stem cells. We have immunomodulators, which change a body's own immune reaction to the virus, and neutralizing antibodies, including convalescent plasma. Others also include repurposed drugs, which are drugs approved for other indications and now are studied for coronavirus. So you see that the diversity of the therapeutic approaches being studied is important because it highlights our understanding of the effects of these different categories of potential treatment. So we do have guidelines for the treatment of COVID-19. The National Institutes of Health developed their own guidelines with experts in the fields of healthcare and clinical science. And they characterize their recommendations into three groups. First is recommends. So here, based on the evidence from the clinical trials and large studies, we have evidence to support usage. And we'll talk about these two drugs next from Desivir and dexamethasone. A second category is insufficient data. So they don't have enough data for a recommendation. And the third category is recommends against. So the data shows safety or efficacy concerns and more clinical trials are needed before usage can be recommended. However, COVID treatment does remain a clinical decision and the guidelines are just a guide. So for patients who are not candidates or fail the recommended agents, there is a possibility that these patients might go to the insufficient data or even recommend against usage, um, provided that there is monitoring. Of course, it always depends on the patient's risk versus benefit. So the number one recommended drug for coronavirus is remdesivir. Remdesivir was originally made to treat Ebola, which is another viral disease. Um, and that one was in Western Africa. So remdesivir had preclinical data showing that the drug was effective against the RSV family, which includes SARS, and that shares a lot of genetic similarities to coronavirus. So the FDA guidelines on who gets from Desivir have been recently updated because there is a very limited supply of Remdesivir. So they wanted to prioritize who receives it. So right now, Remdesivir is recommended for patients who are adults and pediatrics who are hospitalized with severe disease. Severe being defined as patients with an oxygen saturation less than 94%, requiring supplemental oxygen, requiring mechanical ventilation, or on ECMO, which is a machine providing circulatory and respiratory support. So remdesivir, the way it works, we believe it inhibits the viral RNA replication by blocking RNA polymerase. And in non-human studies, remdesivir did reduce virus levels in the lung and did reduce lung damage. So the biggest study showing the efficacy of remdesivir was the one published in New England Journal of Medicine, the ACTT1 study group. And here patients were given either remdesivir or placebo, and this was a randomized placebo-controlled trial. So in this study, they found out that patients who are on remdesivir had a faster recovery time compared to placebo, 11 versus 15 days. And in terms of mortality, the mortality rates were less with remdesivir, about 7% versus 12%. However, at least in this study, the mortality rates did not reach statistical significance. Of course, remdesivir um, has its own safety precautions. 
So first is hypersensitivity. This includes things like infusion-related and anaphylactic reactions that have been reported. They recommend that if this occurs, you can slow infusion rates. Also, don't give this if patients have liver dysfunction, characterized as transaminases greater than five times the upper limit of normal. And in terms of drug interactions, we don't recommend that this will be administered with chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine because it's less effective. And finally, data on pregnancy still remains out. In terms of monitoring, of course, monitor things like renal and hepatic function, chemistries, and hematology. And looking at the costs, so the makers of remdesivir, Gilead, they're currently selling remdesivir to a single US distributor, which is Amerisource, which then gives remdesivir to hospitals identified by the US government. So right now, the hospitals are working with HHS to get remdesivir twice a month through this allocation process. And by the end of September, they predict that the supply will have increased enough to transition to a more traditional supply chain. However, the cost is about $400 a vial. And if you look at a course of therapy, which is usually five days, it's about $3,000 per course, which might not be sustainable if in fact that by September, hospitals have to pay for this themselves. So another drug that the guidelines recommend is dexamethasone. So this is a steroid and it's used for its anti-inflammatory effects. And the guidelines recommend that for patients who are mechanically ventilated, who require oxygen support, or for severe illness, are the patients that get dexamethasone. So similar to remdesivir, these patients have to have severe COVID-19. The dose is listed there. And in terms of side effects, the side effects are all things related to steroids. And we know that steroids have pretty much effects on every single body system. The biggest study showing that dexamethasone works is the recovery trial. So this was a randomized control trial of dexamethasone 2 placebo. And the results found that dexamethasone had a lower mortality rate in patients getting invasive mechanical ventilation and those receiving oxygen without mechanical ventilation compared to placebo. So after this study was published, dexamethasone became standard of care for COVID-19. Right now, there is a shortage of dexamethasone. So the guidelines recommend that you can use other steroids like methylprednisolone or hydrocortisone in situations where this drug may not be available. And finally, we'll talk about hydroxychloroquine and here the guidelines recommend against usage. So this is a pretty infamous drug right now. Um, it's repurposed from usage with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. But you may remember that when there was very limited observational and anecdotal evidence that raised the possibility that this drug may have activity against coronavirus, Trump recommended that this drug would be a game changer in addressing the pandemic. And he openly encouraged patients to take the drug, whether or not they were positive or negative for the virus. And we know later on that this caused a drug shortage where patients with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis who actually needed the drug were unable to get them. So the FDA right now is concluding that the benefits no longer outweigh the risks for using this drug because of the side effects, particularly cardiovascular side effects, arrhythmias, and QT prolongation. 
So right now it's not recommended for the treatment of outpatients. It's only recommended in the setting of a clinical trial. The dose is listed there. Again, hydroxychloroquine is not a benign drug. There's a lot of side effects. So retinopathy and other eye disorders, cardiomyopathy, psoriasis, neuropathy, but the main reason why this was taken off the list was because of the cardiovascular side effects, particularly with the QT prolongation. You may remember that this drug was originally recommended with azithromycin in the study, and both of these drugs together increase the risk of arrhythmias and QT prolongation, which does increase the risk of mortality. So there's a lot of studies showing out there that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. For example, New England Journal of Medicine studied hydroxychloroquine and found out that it did not change mortality. The WHO, the World Health Organization Solidarity Trial showed that there was no change with hydroxychloroquine, as well as the recovery trial showed that mortality was not impacted and both of these studies ended early. So despite this, we no longer recommend hydroxychloroquine except for very severe cases and usually under a recommendation of a clinical trial. So we're gonna shift gears to talking about prevention because right now the entire world is in a race to find the vaccine first. And you can see that there's a diversity of technology platforms. So all vaccines aim to expose the body to an antigen that won't cause the disease, but will provoke an immune response that can block or kill the virus if a person becomes infected. And one of the striking features of vaccine development for COVID-19 is the range of technology of platforms being evaluated from virus vaccines to nucleic acid to viral vectors and even protein-based vaccines. So we'll briefly touch upon these four platforms. Um, one of the most common ones is the virus vaccine. So these teams are developing vaccines using the virus itself, either in a weakened or inactivated form. And many vaccines are made this way, um, such as the measles or the polio vaccine, but especially if this is a live vaccine, it does require extensive safety testing. We have viral vector vaccines. So here a virus, typically the adenovirus, is genetically engineered so that it can produce coronavirus proteins in the body. And these viruses are weakened so that they can't cause the disease. There's two types those that can still replicate in the cells and those that can't because the genes have been disabled. For nucleic acid vaccines, these use genetic instruction either in the form of DNA or RNA for coronavirus proteins that prompts an immune response. So nucleic acid is inserted into human cells, which then churn out copies of the virus protein. Most of these vaccines encode the virus spike protein. And finally, for the coronavirus proteins, here we're directly injecting proteins into the body, either through fragments of protein or protein shells that mimic the virus's outer coat, which are used. So researchers right now in the world are developing more than 160 vaccines against coronavirus, of which over 30 of them are in human studies. So vaccines typically require years of research and testing before reaching the clinic. But right now, scientists are bracing to produce a vaccine as the early of the end of the year. 
So preclinical testing is when scientists gives the vaccine to animals. Phase one studies is when the vaccine is given to a small number of people to test safety and dosage. Phase two is when scientists gives it to hundreds of people and phase three is when the vaccine is given to thousands of people before the vaccine is finally approved. So looking at the vaccines that are in the latter stages of development, we have two approved vaccines, one in China and one in Russia. However, the most potential that we have in the US are the ones in the combined phases or phase three. So the Pfizer Biotech, AstraZeneca, Oxford, and the Moderna studies are the ones that I would say have the most potential to be marketed by the end of the year. So vaccine development is a pretty lengthy, extensive process. It usually takes multiple candidates and years to make a licensed vaccine. Because of the costs and high failure rates, usually developers follow a linear sequence of steps with multiple pauses for data analysis and checks. However, developing a vaccine quickly requires a new paradigm with many very fast starts and steps executed in parallel before confirming a successful outcome. So of course, this does result in a lot of financial risk if the vaccine doesn't work. And we're seeing right now that a lot of companies are combining steps. So for example, for some vaccines, phase one clinical trials may be done in parallel with animal studies. So for most of these vaccines, you need either one or two doses to produce immunity. And the side effects in most of these studies were mild, typically in injection site reactions, fever, headaches, but really no major side effects, which is good news. Of course, conducting clinical trials in a pandemic poses a lot of challenges. Um, one thing is that it's kind of difficult to predict where the outbreaks are going to occur to prepare these sites to coincide with vaccine readiness for testing. And the pandemics will generate a lot of demand for vaccines around the world. So studies will be needed to confirm which populations are at the highest risk once the vaccines are available. And this could form the basis of establishing a globally fair allocation system for the vaccines. So to summarize, I think that was a lot of information, but here are some take home points that I want you to remember. So first is that evidence-based medicine is the key and you need to look into randomized control studies for the answers. So whenever you see a claim that something works for coronavirus, ask yourself, where's the evidence? So empower yourself to make your own judgments about what is scientifically right or wrong because what's happening is some people who don't have a lot of scientific backgrounds are reading the studies and making incorrect conclusions. Also, keep in mind that there's good studies and bad studies that are published, and you should evaluate yourself if these studies really change your practice. So ask if the study is clinically significant, and of course, higher evidence studies are things like randomized controlled trials. Also be flexible with your treatment protocols because information is constantly changing. So in the medical field, change can be slow with typically year long studies that are needed before recommendations are changed. However, the protocols for COVID-19 have evolved at lightning speed from wearing a mask, who gets tested, and now what to use and what not to use. So you should be flexible and be up to date because what was done yesterday could no longer be the case tomorrow. And finally, effective control and eradication of COVID-19 will require successful prevention and treatment protocols. So working in the medical sector, we always shift focus to treatment. I think that 
COVID has shifted the paradigm because now we're finally thinking about prevention. And to have control of any disease, the gold standard really is both prevention and treatment. So preventing the cases to be positive and making sure that we have good treatment of the positive cases. And that's why this talk focuses both on the preventative side, which is vaccines, and the treatment side, which is remdesivir and dexamethasone, because both are going to be your gold standard on how to tackle coronavirus. So that was pretty much the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for having me, and I'll take your questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Dang, for an enlightening presentation on treatments and vaccine developments for COVID-19. We really appreciate having this mysterious area clarified. So we do have a few questions from the audience. So one of the first questions is, what does the coronavirus treatment acceleration program entail? So this program is a program by the Food and Drug Administration, and it allows drug therapies to be expedited through clinical trials and protocol reviews. So typically, it takes usually a long time for drugs to be researched, to be studied, and then approved on the market. In this program, because we are in the middle of pandemic, the FDA is expediting this process so that clinical trials are reviewed faster more wealth of information is being shared between researchers and the public. And if there is data on safety and efficacy, it will be pushed to the public faster. But at the same time, there will be post-marketing surveillance to make sure that the drug remains safe and effective to our study population. Thank you. Another question is, would you recommend getting any of the vaccines that might come up by the end of this year? I've heard different points of views since enough time has not passed for enough research. Sure. So um, you probably heard that in other countries, they really pushed for their vaccines. So China, Russia was the newest one with the Sputnik vaccine. Um, and I think that they were rushed too quickly before the claims of efficacy and safety have been done. Um, despite this um, treatment acceleration program, the key is that we're not gonna rush any drugs or vaccine until they are safe and effective. So I think there's three right now that might have the most potential. The Moderna vaccine is the one that's in the phase three clinical trials that may be out at the end of the year, but the um, US government has also supported vaccines for the Pfizer one and the Oxford study. So I think that it is reasonable for these vaccines to be developed by the end of the year. Um, in terms of safety and efficacy, um, most of these vaccines have shown very good immune responses, even in select patient populations, for example, the elderly. Um, and right now, there's limited evidence that they show major side effects. So um, I think that these three drugs have the most potential. Of course, what we're trying to do is aim for that 50%. So if that vaccine can achieve immunity in 50% of all people, then the FDA will fast track that vaccine to the public. Um, and of course, once that happens, there's allocation processes and distribution processes that have to be considered. But I think that we are headed in the right track right now. One more question. What is the reasoning behind pairing hydroxyquinolone with azithromycin? And does hydroxyquinolone need to be taken long-term in order to see cardiovascular side effects? So that combination was first originated from a France study where they studied in a very small sample hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And they thought that with that pairing, it would decrease viral activity. Most of this was found in vitro. Um, 
you don't have to take this long term to have cardiovascular toxicity because um, there's a drug interaction that occurs if you take the two together, um, which is the QT prolongation. And especially in patients who are elderly, who have a high QT interval at baseline, they were seeing added mortality with this combination. So um, again, this is no longer recommended. I know that when the guidelines were first out and all this information was out with hydroxychloroquine, a lot of the hospitals used it. And since this shift in the FDA recommendations, we've all stopped doing it and taken it off of formulary. So again, they don't recommend this, especially the combination, because there's a higher risk of cardiovascular toxicities, unless you're doing this in the clinical trials. But keep in mind that the trials that have studied this have stopped early because of no changes in mortality or benefits. If the virus is mutated, will there be an annual vaccine like influenza? Yes, so that's what we're concerned with. So if we're choosing parts of the virus or parts of the vaccine and making targeted vaccines based on these components, are the components that we're choosing the right components so that it won't mutate like influenza. You probably heard that coronavirus has a lot of strains and it does mutate. So um, this could be seasonal. Um, right now though, the current strain that we have is the one that we're making the vaccines against. However, if this mutates like what happened in the Spanish flu of 1918, um, the vaccines that we are currently creating um, the parts that we're creating vaccines for might be completely irrelevant. Of course, we are trying to create the vaccines that target things that don't mutate. But um, again, looking at how we make vaccines for flu, there are some years when we only had about 20% efficacy for the flu. So again, some of the research and prediction models might be off if the virus mutates, especially through antigenic drift or shift. Uh, another question is, um, if you only have one option, what do you prefer, remdesivir or dexamethasone? So right now, the problem is that both drugs are used for severe COVID-19. So if you're in a hospital, you kind of have to have a low oxygen saturation, you have to have mechanical ventilation or on ECMO. So for most of the patients, hopefully they're not hospitalized. Um, if they're out at home and they're testing positive, then they do not get these therapies. So looking at the hospitalized patients who have severe disease, um, keep in mind that already by the time, especially you're ventilated, um, you already have a high risk of death already. So these drugs, if you look at the studies, even though that they're clinically significant, it's only a matter about 5% change compared to placebo. So um, again, it's all about risk versus benefit. I know that in our practice, we're using both. So dexamethasone plus remdesivir, but um, at least the patients that I'm working with, the fact that they're already mechanically ventilated on this, um, their mortality risk is so great that these drugs may not be that beneficial because they have so many things going against them at this point. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, what are the differences, if any, between the Moderna, the Pfizer, and the Oxford vaccines being developed in the US? So the Moderna is a nucleic acid vaccine. Um, the Pfizer Biotech one is also nucleic acid and the Oxford one is a viral vector vaccine. So there's differences in technology and components, but most of these vaccines are showing very positive results. 
Um, another difference is that the Moderna one um, has been tested through phase one to three clinical trials versus the other two are kind of in a combined phase as a way to expedite research. So they're kind of in a phase two, phase three study where um, they're studying it in a bigger group of people and trying to skip steps that way. It's, it's not wrong and um, it's just so that we can expedite this process. But um, all three vaccines I think have a lot of potential. They've shown that they have some efficacy um, and the safety um, benefits are pretty good because the toxicities are very limited. Thank you. And one last question for you. Once infected, are you immune to reinfection? So I think that's what research needs to prove because what's happening is that people who have been infected with coronavirus um, after a couple of weeks to months are not showing positive for antibodies. And we know that antibodies are a sign of immunity. So maybe this is because the infection for coronavirus is not strong enough to make memory cells over a long period of time. And we are seeing cases that um, patients who have coronavirus can be reinfected a second time. So maybe there's mutations with coronavirus and there may be more than one strain. So this is kind of why vaccine development is taking this long because there's a lot of factors that you have to consider, one of which is if the virus mutates, is your vaccine going to be effective? And again, 50% is what the FDA is aiming for for immunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Dang. And for anyone whose questions weren't answered yet, we will also, as a reminder, have a full panel question and answer session at the end. So now I would like to introduce Suchi who's gonna start our PPE video. Okay, hey everyone, I'm Sikita Javeri from UTR GB School of Medicine. So before we break for lunch, we wanted to share a video with you all. Um, as we adjust to our new normal, we have to use face masks to protect ourselves and others. Um, the COVID Decoded Student Planning Committee actually made a short PPE video to help clarify how to use and store your mask. Um, we really hope you enjoy it and find it useful. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. In this video, we will show you how to put on your face mask. Before touching your mask, wash your hands with soap and warm water or use hand sanitizer. Make sure your mask is not damaged or dirty. Check the front and the back of the mask while holding it by the ear loops. Before putting on the mask, make sure the colored side is on the outside and that the metal nose strip is at the top. Hold the mask by the ear loops and place it over your face, making sure it covers your entire nose and mouth. Pull on the top and bottom edges of the mask to expand it over your nose and chin. Pinch the metal strip so that it fits snug over your nose. If the mask is not a snug fit over your face, try twisting both ear loops. Make sure you do not touch the outside of the mask. If you do, wash or sanitize your hands immediately. Before removing your mask, sanitize your hands once again. To remove the mask, hold the mask by both ear loops and lift it off your face. Wash or sanitize your hands again. The same method applies if you are using a reusable cloth face mask. However, 
Make sure to store your reusable mask so that they do not touch your other items. Something similar to a zippable plastic bag would work. Do not touch the outside and sanitize your hands afterwards. Valve masks have also become popular. However, these are not ideal because the one-way valve doesn't protect others around you. In fact, they may actually spread your germs to others. Thank you so much for participating in our webinar. Be sure to practice social distancing and stay safe.